this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Hello and welcome to another episode of Safety FM with Jay Allen. I hope everything is good and grand inside of your neck of the woods. Now, today I'm going to do something that I haven't done in a very long period of time. We did it on the Rated R Safety Show, but I thought that we would try it out today on this episode. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to be introduced to Tom Sampson, is I believe what the guy's name is. And then you're going to hear me on this episode that's called the G Podcast. Yeah, you heard me, the G Podcast. And you're going to go, what's going on here? What's, I mean, this is a little convoluted. Well, let me explain what happened. Somebody recently contacted me and offered me AI generative podcasting. AI generative in regards of information of it creating a script for you, it recreating my voice, and even creating a guest. And I was like, this has to sound kind of, uh, kind of wonky in regard to doing it. And I said, why don't we give this a try today? So I went ahead and had a whole episode generated about behavior-based safety and safety differently. And what I want you to do is not just listen to the context of the information inside of this podcast. I want you to take a listen to how it sounds in regards of what's being done in regards to the world of AI. So take a listen, sit back and relax. This is Safety FM with Jay Allen. And take a listen to AI Generated Jay. And AI generated Tom Sampson. Take a listen right now. Welcome to the G Podcast, where we dive deep into the stuff they don't discuss. I'm your host, Jay Allen, and I am thrilled to have you with us today. This podcast is all about exploring the nuances and complexities of safety in the workplace. Each episode, we bring in experts to share their insights and experiences. So, Tom, let's delve a little deeper into your professional background. Uh, Can you walk us through your journey in the safety industry? How did it all begin for you? All right, Tom, let's dive into the core of our discussion. We've touched on your background, but now I want to get into the concept of safety differently. Can you explain to our listeners what safety differently is all about? Sure, Jay. Safety differently is a paradigm shift in how we approach safety in the workplace. Traditionally, safety management has been about compliance and controlling workers' behaviors, essentially following a top-down approach, safety differently. On the other hand, focuses on creating an environment where safety is a natural outcome of how work is designed and managed. That sounds quite different from the conventional practices we are used to. What are some of the core principles of safety differently? There are three main principles. First, we must see people as a solution, not a problem. This means valuing workers' expertise and insights into how to make work safer. Second, safety is an ethical responsibility, which emphasizes that everyone deserves to go home safe at the end of the day. And third, safety should focus on the presence of positives, not just the absence of negatives. This means looking at what goes right and fostering those conditions. That's interesting. It seems to be a more holistic approach. How does this impact the overall culture in a workplace? It has a profound impact. By focusing on trust, learning, and collaboration, companies can build a culture where employees feel valued and empowered. This leads to a more engaged workforce that proactively contributes to a safer working environment. It's about creating a shared responsibility for safety rather than viewing it as a burdensome requirement. How do organizations typically transition to this safety differently approach? The transition can vary, but it generally involves a shift in mindset from management and leadership down to frontline workers. Organizations need to prioritize open communication and willingness to learn from everyday work experiences. It also requires investing in safety as an integral part of work processes rather than an add-on task. This is a fascinating approach to safety. Thank you for breaking that down, Tom. Coming up next, we'll explore another important aspect of workplace safety, the concept of behavior-based safety. Stay tuned. So, Tom, now that we've explored how safety differently is defined, let's delve into its more traditional counterpart, behavior-based safety or BBs. Uh, Can you start by giving us an overview of what behavior-based safety entails? Absolutely, Jay. Behavior-based safety focuses heavily on the actions of employees. 
It operates on the premise that most workplace accidents are a result of unsafe behaviors. Interesting. So how does behavior-based safety actually work in practice? What are some common elements that companies usually implement? In practice, behavior-based safety typically involves a few key components. Observation, feedback, and reinforcement. Employees are often observed performing their tasks and the observers. Sometimes fellow employees are designated safety personnel. Identify any unsafe behaviors. And what happens uh, after these observations? After the observations, feedback is given to the employees about their unsafe behaviors. The idea is to correct these behaviors through constructive feedback and positive reinforcement. The aim is to encourage safe practices continually. What kind of reinforcement are we talking about here? Reinforcement can vary. It could be as simple as verbal praise or more tangible rewards like incentives and recognition programs. The goal is to motivate employees to consistently engage in safe behaviors. Sounds pretty structured. Are there any criticisms or limitations of the behavior-based safety approach? Yes, there are some notable criticisms. One major limitation is that BBs can sometimes place an undue emphasis on individual behavior while neglecting systemic issues in the workplace. It might not address other critical factors like equipment safety, organizational culture, or environmental conditions. See, so it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. Are there any other potential drawbacks that companies should be aware of? Another drawback is that it can be time-consuming and resource-intensive to continually observe and give feedback. And if not implemented correctly, it can be perceived as punitive rather than supportive, which can create resistance among employees. Thank you for that detailed breakdown, Tom. Clearly, behavior-based safety has its strengths and weaknesses. Up next, we'll compare the two approaches to see how they stack up against each other. All right, Tom, we spent some time delving into behavior-based safety, but let's shift gears a bit. I understand there's another approach you advocate for known as safety differently. Can you explain what sets safety differently apart from behavior-based safety? Absolutely, Jay. Safety differently is a paradigm shift in many ways. While behavior-based safety tends to focus on the actions and behaviors of individual workers, safety differently takes a broader view. It looks at the entire system, including organizational culture, operational procedures, and the environment in which people work. The goal is to design the system in a way that makes safe behaviors the default choice. That sounds intriguing. How does this broader approach impact the responsibility shouldered by the organization compared to behavior-based safety, which sounds more worker-centric? Good observation, Jay. In behavior-based safety, the onus is often on the individual worker to adhere to safety protocols, and incidents are frequently attributed to their failure to follow these rules. On the other hand, safety differently shifts much of this responsibility to the organization itself. It requires leadership to critically evaluate and redesign their systems and processes to prioritize safety from the ground up. So would you say that safety differently is more proactive while behavior-based safety is somewhat reactive? Exactly. Behavior-based safety often involves identifying unsafe behaviors and then trying to correct them, which can be seen as a reactive approach. Safety differently, however, is proactive. It anticipates systemic issues that could lead to unsafe behaviors and addresses these issues before they can manifest as incident. It's about building resilience into the system. Setting. Are there specific industries or types of organizations where safety differently is especially beneficial? While both approaches have their merits in various settings, safety differently is particularly effective in complex and high-risk industries. Take aviation or nuclear power, for instance. These sectors benefit immensely from a systems-oriented approach because there are so many variables at play and the cost of failure is extraordinarily high. But even beyond these high-risk areas, any organization looking to build a resilient and adaptable safety culture can reap the benefits of safety differently. Thanks for shedding light on that, Tom. The difference in focus between the two approaches is quite illuminating. Now, let's segue into another important aspect of safety that's often misunderstood. Our next section will delve into misconceptions in safety. We'll be right back. So we've just looked at the differences between safety differently and behavior-based safety. Now let's delve into some of the common misconceptions in safety practices and industry norms. Tom, can you share your insights on this? Absolutely, Jay. 
One of the biggest misconceptions is that safety is purely a matter of compliance, that if you just follow the rules, you'll be safe. While there's truth in that, it's far from the whole picture. True safety requires a culture change and proactive engagement. That's a great point. People often think that just having safety protocols in place is enough. What other misconceptions do you think are common in the industry? Another prevailing myth is that all incidents are caused by worker error. This line of thinking ignores systemic issues like equipment malfunction, process flaws, or even poor management decisions. It puts an unfair and often detrimental focus solely on the individual worker's behavior. I've noticed that the blame game tends to surface uh, frequently in discussions about safety. Uh, could you talk a little more about how these misconceptions affect day-to-day -day operations in a company? Sure. These misconceptions can lead to a lack of trust between employees and management. When workers feel constantly blamed, it erodes their willingness to report near misses or hazards, which are crucial for improving safety. It becomes more about avoiding punishment than genuinely enhancing safety outcomes. That's a critical insight. Do you think some of these misconceptions are residual effects from past safety strategies? Definitely. Traditional models of safety often focused on rigid hierarchies and strict compliance. While they had their merits, they didn't consider the human element and how individuals interact with their environments. This dated thinking still pervades many organizations, making it hard to shift towards more modern, effective approaches. It sounds like awareness and education are key to breaking down these outdated mindsets. Any final thoughts on how organizations can address these misconceptions? Yes, Jay. It's essential for organizations to foster a learning culture where feedback is valued and mistakes are seen as opportunities for improvement. Providing continuous training and open lines of communication can also help clear up these misconceptions, ultimately leading to a safer work environment. Thank you for sharing those insights and clearing up some misconceptions about safety differently, Tom. Now, let's move on to discuss some real-world applications of safety differently. It's always enlightening to understand how theories and concepts are being practically applied in the real world. Tom, can you share some examples or case studies where safety differently has been successfully implemented? All right, Tom, we've just covered some real world applications of the safety differently approach. It's time to shift gears slightly and delve into some of the challenges that come with behavior based safety or BBs. So let's discuss the limitations and obstacles folks might encounter when implementing BBS. Could you start by explaining what you believe to be the most significant challenge? Absolutely, Jay. One of the primary challenges with behavior-based safety is its heavy reliance on human observation and intervention. While this can be powerful, it also opens the floor to subjective biases and inconsistencies. Individuals might perceive and report behaviors differently, and this can undermine the reliability of the data collected. Moreover, there's always the risk that employees might feel they are being constantly watched, leading to anxiety and stress rather than actual safety improvements. That makes a lot of sense, Tom. When people's perceptions and observations become part of the safety process, you're inevitably going to run into some inconsistencies. Now, what about the practical aspects of implementing BBS? Are there logistical or resource-related challenges that organizations face? Definitely, Jay. Implementing an effective BBS program requires a considerable investment in both time and resources. It not only needs comprehensive training for the workforce, but also dedicated personnel to oversee the program, collect data, and analyze results. Smaller organizations might struggle with these requirements, making it difficult to sustain a long-term initiative. Furthermore, embedding new behaviors within a culture takes time. And the immediacy of safety concerns means companies can't always afford to wait. It's clear that the resources required can be a significant barrier. What about the resistance to change within the workforce? Do employees generally embrace BBs or do you often see pushback? Resistance to change is indeed another significant challenge, Jay. Introducing BBs often means altering long-standing practices and mindsets. Employees who have been used to certain ways of working might feel threatened by the new focus on behavior, 
perceiving it as an encroachment on their autonomy. Overcoming this resistance necessitates not just clear communication, but also involving employees in the process from the very beginning to help them understand and buy into the benefits of BBs. Involving employees seems crucial to overcoming resistance. Lastly, Tom, are there any challenges related to the integration of BBS with existing safety systems and protocols? Yes, integration can be challenging, too. Organizations often have established safety protocols, and layering a BBS program on top of these requires careful coordination. Without proper alignment, there can be confusion and overlapping responsibilities, which might dilute the effectiveness of both systems. Success in integration largely depends on a clear strategy and communication plan, ensuring that BBS complements rather than conflicts with existing measures. Thank you, Tom. That insightful overview highlights several key challenges with behavior-based safety. Now, let's transition to discussing the role of employees in safety since their involvement is crucial in both BBs and safety differently. Stay with us as we explore how employees can actively contribute to creating safer work environments. We've just explored some of the challenges that come with implementing behavior-based safety programs. Now, let's shift our focus toward a crucial aspect that often gets overlooked, the role of employees in safety. Tom, you've worked extensively in safety management over the years. Could you share your insights on the importance of employee engagement in maintaining a safe work environment? Absolutely, Jay. The role of employees in safety cannot be overstated. They are the ones on the front lines experiencing the daily realities of the workplace. Their involvement is key to identifying hazards and developing practical solutions. How would you describe the relationship between an employee's engagement and the overall safety culture of an organization? Employee engagement directly impacts the safety culture. When employees feel they have a voice and their opinions matter, they are more likely to participate actively in safety programs. This leads to a more proactive approach to safety rather than a reactive one. Can you give us an example of how employee involvement has positively impacted safety in a workplace setting? Sure. One example that comes to mind is a manufacturing plant where employees were encouraged to report near misses. This led to an influx of valuable data, which the safety team used to identify patterns and implement preventive measures. As a result, both the frequency and severity of accidents decreased significantly. That's fascinating. So beyond reporting near misses, what other ways can employees contribute to improving safety? Employees can contribute in many ways, participating in safety committees, attending training sessions, and even taking part in safety audits. Encouraging open dialogue about safety concerns and suggestions also plays a critical role. It sounds like fostering this type of engagement requires a lot of trust and communication. How can organizations effectively build this trust? Trust is indeed essential. Organizations can build it by being transparent about safety initiatives and outcomes, responding promptly to safety concerns and recognizing employees' contributions to safety improvements. Leadership also needs to lead by example demonstrating that safety is a core value. Creating that culture of safety sounds like it requires a united effort from both employees and management. As we transition to our next topic, which will focus on leadership's role in safety differently, it's clear that employee engagement forms the bedrock upon which these strategies are built. Moving on, let's delve into the role of leadership in the safety differently paradigm. Leadership attitudes and actions can significantly impact how safety is perceived and practiced within an organization. Absolutely, Jay. Leaders set the tone for safety culture. When leaders genuinely prioritize safety and show a commitment to it, employees are more likely to adopt safe practices themselves. So how exactly do leadership attitudes make a difference? Can you provide some examples of effective leadership behaviors uh, in safety differently? Effective leadership in safety differently involves being visible and active in the safety process. This means not just talking about safety, but also participating in safety meetings, visiting job sites, and engaging with employees about their safety concerns. I've heard that leaders who are more approachable and open to feedback tend to have better safety outcomes. Would you agree? Yes, definitely. Approachability and openness to feedback are crucial. Leaders should encourage employees to speak up about safety issues without fear of reprisal. This helps in identifying potential hazards before they result in incidents. It's interesting how 
leadership behaviors uh, can align or contrast with traditional behavior based safety models. What do you think are the main differences? In traditional behavior-based safety, the focus is often on frontline employees' behaviors. Safety differently shifts that focus to include how leadership and organizational systems contribute to safety. It's a more holistic approach. So it's not just about correcting unsafe behaviors, but also about understanding and improving the systems and conditions that lead to those behaviors. Exactly. Leaders need to look at why unsafe behaviors might occur and address those underlying issues. This could involve training, resources, or changes in procedures. The goal is to create an environment where safe choices are the easiest choices. That's a helpful distinction. Let's get more specific. How can leaders demonstrate their commitment to safety differently on a daily basis? Leaders can show their commitment by being present and involved in safety activities, conducting regular safety audits, and by consistently communicating the importance of safety. Importantly, they should also recognize and reward safe behaviors and practices within their teams. It seems that leadership in safety differently requires a proactive approach rather than a reactive one. Indeed, Jay, proactive leadership means anticipating potential safety issues and addressing them before they result in incidents. It's about fostering a continuous improvement mindset within the organization. Thank you for the insights, Tom. Now, as we transition to our next section... Now that we've talked extensively about leadership's role in safety differently, let's pivot our focus to data and metrics. This is an area where safety differently and behavior-based safety differ quite significantly. Tom, can you shed some light on how data and metrics are utilized in behavior-based safety compared to safety differently? Absolutely, Jay. In behavior-based safety, data and metrics are typically focused on measuring individual behaviors. For instance, organizations often track the frequency of safety observations, the number of safety infractions, and the resultant corrective actions. The aim is to modify individual behavior through these metrics. That's interesting. So the primary focus is on the individual. Exactly. The belief is that by changing individual behaviors, you can improve overall safety performance. The metrics are essentially used to hold individuals accountable and to ensure compliance with set safety procedures. How does that compare to how data and metrics are used in the context of safety differently? In safety differently, the approach is quite different. Here, metrics are utilized to understand the broader organizational context rather than just individual behaviors. The focus is on understanding how the work is actually done what kinds of dilemmas and constraints workers face and how these factors contribute to overall safety. So it's less about individual accountability and more about understanding the system as a whole. Exactly. The metrics in safety differently are meant to provide insights into the complexities and dynamics of the work environment, helping to identify systemic issues that could be causing unsafe conditions. This approach encourages a more holistic view of safety. That makes sense. Can you give an example of a metric that might be used in safety differently? Sure. Instead of just counting how many times someone made an error, you might look at metrics like the number of reported near misses or incidents with a focus on understanding the conditions that led to them. This way, you're gaining insights into potential systemic flaws in the work process or environment. And assume this helps in creating more effective and sustainable safety interventions. Yes, it does. By focusing on understanding and improving the complex systems in which people work, organizations can create safer environments that support workers in making safer choices naturally rather than relying solely on modifying individual behavior. Third, that there are significant differences in how data and metrics are used in these two approaches, each with its own set of advantages and challenges. Thank you for shedding light on this important topic, Tom. My pleasure, Jay. As we transition from discussing the importance of data and metrics and safety, it's pivotal to delve into how cultural shifts within organizations can significantly enhance the adoption of safety differently. Safety differently requires a fundamental change in how safety is perceived and managed within a company. This isn't just about implementing new systems or measures. It's about transforming the organizational culture to truly prioritize safety as a core value. Absolutely, Jay. A key aspect of this cultural shift involves moving away from a blame-centric approach. Traditionally, safety has often been about identifying and punishing errors. But for safety differently to work, 
we need to focus on understanding why errors occur and addressing those root causes. That makes a lot of sense, Tom. So what concrete steps can organizations take to foster this kind of cultural change? First and foremost, it starts with leadership. Leaders need to visibly prioritize safety in their actions and communications. It's also essential for them to create an environment where employees feel safe to speak up about safety concerns without fear of retribution. Leadership setting the tone is critical, but how do we get that message to permeate through all levels of the organization? Engagement is key. Encouraging participation in safety initiatives and involving employees in safety planning and decision-making processes can make a huge difference. It's about making safety a shared responsibility rather than a top-down mandate. That shared responsibility can certainly lead to more innovative and effective safety solutions. Tom, can you share an example of an organization that successfully made this cultural shift? Sure. One company that comes to mind is a large construction firm that significantly reduced its incident rates by completely overhauling its safety culture. They implemented regular safety workshops, peer-to-peer learning sessions, and used storytelling to highlight safety successes and lessons learned. It's inspiring to hear such success stories. Ultimately, creating a culture that supports safety differently isn't just about reducing incidents, but also about building a more resilient and adaptive organization. As we move forward in our discussion, it's important to transition smoothly into looking at some of the common pitfalls organizations might encounter. This way we can preemptively address potential challenges they might face in their journey towards a safer, more inclusive workplace. Welcome back, everyone. We've had an insightful discussion on cultural shifts in safety, and now we're moving on to something equally important. We're going to talk about common pitfalls companies encounter when transitioning to safety differently practices. Tom, what have you seen as the most frequent mistakes in this shift? Thanks, Jake. One of the most frequent mistakes I've observed is companies simply rebranding their existing safety programs without actually changing their approach or processes. They call it safety differently, but continue to use the same old behavior-based safety methods, which undermines the true essence of the shift. Sounds like it creates a disconnect. Can you elaborate on how this misalignment impacts the effectiveness of safety initiatives? Absolutely. This kind of misalignment sends mixed messages to employees when companies claim to adopt safety differently but continue to manage safety the old way. Workers generally see through it. This inconsistency can lead to a lack of trust and engagement, which are crucial for the success of safety differently. I see. Trust and engagement are certainly pivotal. What are other common pitfalls companies should watch out for? Another major pitfall is not involving employees in the process. Safety differently is fundamentally about valuing frontline workers' insights and experiences if management makes changes without involving those who are actually doing the work. They miss out on valuable insights, and employees may feel alienated and less likely to buy into new initiatives. Involvement seems key to getting it right. Are there any challenges related to leadership in this transition? Certainly, Jay. Leaders need to embody the principles of safety differently. However, a common mistake is leaders failing to walk the talk. They may endorse the new approach in words, but revert to old habits in their actions, like focusing solely on lagging indicators or punishing individuals for incidents. This undermines the credibility of the entire initiative. That makes perfect sense. Any final thoughts on how companies can avoid these pitfalls and ensure a smoother transition? To avoid these pitfalls, companies should start by genuinely understanding the philosophy behind safety differently. It's not just a rebranding exercise. It's a fundamental shift in how safety is perceived and managed. Engage all levels of the organization, from leadership to frontline workers, and ensure that actions align with the new approach. Consistent and transparent communication is vital to maintain trust and engagement throughout the transition. Thank you, Tom, for shedding light on these common pitfalls. It's evident that a genuine commitment and understanding are crucial for a successful transition to safety differently. Now let's transition to our next section where we'll discuss the future of safety management and emerging trends. As we wrap up our discussion on common pitfalls to avoid in safety management, let's pivot towards a topic that's equally intriguing, the future of safety management. 
As we approach the end of our insightful conversation, uh, it's clear that we've unearthed some truly significant points about the distinction between safety differentlies and behavior-based safety, as well as the broader implications for safety management. Absolutely, Jay. Delving into the stuff they don't discuss is, has shed light on how pivotal it is to look beyond the standard paradigms and explore these nuanced perspectives. This discussion has reinforced the necessity of critical thinking and adopting a multifaceted approach to safety management. For sure. One of the core takeaways for me is just how crucial it is to have a flexible and dynamic approach. So, so safety differently encourages that critical thinking and adaptability, whereas behavior-based safety, despite its merits, sometimes risks oversimplifying complex human behaviors. Right. And that simplification can lead to overlooking the systemic issues that underpin many safety challenges. Addressing these root causes is fundamental for creating sustainable change rather than just targeting symptoms on the surface. It's been great to get your perspective on these topic. Tom, your hand, your insights regarding the deeper, often overlooked elements of safety management are invaluable. I hope our audience has found this as enlightening as I have. Thank you, Jay. It's been a pleasure to share these thoughts and address the critical facets that often escape the mainstream conversations. To all our listeners, we appreciate you joining us today. Think critically about your approach to safety, question existing paradigms, and always strive for improvement. I have been your safety manager and host, and until next time, stay safe and stay informed. So what'd you think? I mean, I just want you to take a listen to this. Imagine where we are located right now. This is the beginning of how this stuff is starting. What is it going to sound like in the near future? Kind of interesting on when you start thinking about it. Anyways, I've been your safety manager and host, Jay Allen. And until next time, be safe. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.